Hi everyone, I'm going to give you a talk today about a group of poets called the Objectivist Poets. Now this is um, a continuation of uh, the talks I've been giving on modernism uh, to give you a few insights into modernist poetry. Um, so, you know, as you can imagine, modernism uh, developed in, in the novel, um, in drama and in poetry, the three arch genres. Now, uh, objectivism is one of the splinter groups that broke uh, away from modernism, not broke away, let's say that they that developed out of, out of modernism. Uh, and I said in a previous video that usually the closing date for modernism uh, is given as you know the 1930 around that that date um, uh, now the one of the few uh, groups that developed in the 1930s that were interested in experimentation were the objectivist poets so you could say they they prolonged uh, the the concerns the pursuits of uh, the great high modernists like uh, T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound. Uh, you could, you know, those two writers are the f sort of founding fathers of modernist poetry. Uh, T.S. Eliot, as I mentioned, uh, was, you know, is remembered for, well, his great lyrics, but also his techniques, uh, most notably montage, the montage technique, which is um, a the breaking off of one unit of poetry uh, and its juxtaposition with another unit of poetry without any uh, transitional material in between. Right? So the, the reader has to provide the, the links uh, or just accept that there are no links um, and that experience is fragmentary um, and well especially after the First World War there was this sense of dislocation that is reflected in the the very structure of of these poems. So that's what's called organic structure rather than fixed form. Organic structure is a structure that grows out of the experience of writing the poem itself. It follows uh, like a, something growing, something organic. It follows the movement of of experience. So uh, now the objectivist poets. Um, there, there were five of them, um, five main ones, let's say, um, and maybe a few followers, but let's say that it was a relative, relatively restrained uh, small movement. Um, its main practitioners are Louis Zukovsky, Charles Reznikov, uh, Karl Rakosi, uh, George Oppen, and last but not least, Lorreen Niedeker, also pronounced Nidecker. Um, she's usually added, um, well, in recent accounts, but not in the mainstream accounts, uh, since she was a bit of an outsider. Um, the other four were from New York, so you could say that objectivism was a kind of New York-based school. Um, and she came from rural Wisconsin. Uh, but her concerns are, are quite close to the concerns of the objectivists, and so she should really be um, counted as one of them. Now, the English poet Basil Bunting is sometimes also uh, added as a kind of outrider uh, who was influenced by objectivism. Um, he's usually seen as a kind of patriotic poet, which he was, but uh, he also shared their... Um, formalist concerns. So, um, so that's for the geographical location of, of this uh, school. Now it's not really a school in the sense that they all shared the same interests and you know had a, a set of, of objectives that were well defined and you know none of them stuck to any principles. Uh, initially they were just called objectivist poets by Louis Zukovsky. Uh, because they were the poets he liked and uh, used to hang out with. Um, so it didn't really have much cohesion. But there are still some 
principles that seem that most of them seem to adhere to. Um, now the main one is um, an interest in objects, right? as it's as the name of the the movement suggests. Um, so now you could say that imagism, which preceded it, uh, was maybe the first object-based poetry. Uh, this was a, a movement founded by uh, Ezra Pound, who we have here, if you remember him, my laminated literary lollipop, also known as a bauble. Um, so this uh, literary lollipop is Ezra Pound, and uh, he, he was one of the great organizers, one of the great... Um, men of letters who made people meet, who got people together, got great writers together. Uh, so, you know, if, if only for that, he's, he's, uh, should be remembered as, uh, as a great leader of literary men, a great starter of literary reputations. Um, so Ezra Pound here uh, founded Imagism uh, around 1912, uh, he came up with this credo, um, you know, this, this belief in what poetry should be. Um, now, he, his credo was that you should treat the thing directly, right? Direct treatment of the thing, whether subjective or objective. Um, that there shouldn't be too much philosophy, too much uh, abstract thinking, or any kind of beating around the bush, you should treat the object directly and simply. Um, so this imagism um, ha had an influence on, on other forms of poetry, but it, it gave rise directly to objectivism later. Um, so, thanks, you, you can go now. Okay, so um, as I was saying, uh, objectivism uh, tended to grow out of, of imagism, um, but it wasn't a rejection of imagism, uh, more a kind of creative tension uh, that, that it had with imagist poetry. Um, so the, the main uh, difference between imagism and objectivism is that objectivism tends to comment on itself more. It's more self-reflexive, whereas imagism um, usually deals with... Uh, uh, it is more of a transparent window onto, uh, onto reality, you could say. It's not photographic realism, but let's say there's, there isn't too much self-reflexive um, there aren't too many re self-reflexive elements. Um, so, you know, William Carlos Williams, the, the main uh, proponent of imagism, uh, famously said, no ideas, but in things. Um, so that really defines imagism. Uh, objectivism uh, can be more philosophical. Um, but as I say, it's mostly that it's more self-reflexive um, and it also emphasizes more the form of the poem. Um, so you have this idea that uh, poetry must be a shape, uh, hence, hence the term objectivism. You are creating a shape, a form, and that po the poem itself is an object among other objects. Um, so it really emphasized that notion of organic form uh, that grows out of, out of experience. Um, so that's the, the main uh, difference. It, it also emphasized uh, syntactic fragmentation more uh, and often interrupted uh, the natural flow of speech. Right, so the line breaks, what's called lineation, the line breaks uh, tend to occur in slightly unnatural places to disrupt um, natural speech, to draw attention 
to the creation of the poem uh, as a lineated object. Um, now, because it developed in the 1930s and went on roughly till the 1960s, virtually unnoticed, um, very few anthologies anthologized them. The Norton Anthology, the most famous of all anthologies, doesn't have a single objectivist poem in it. Um, so because it went on from, it started in the 1930s, uh, it was initially quite politicized. Uh, as you know, the 1930s were uh, a time of politics, um, you know, very radical politics often. Um, and so uh, Zukovsky particularly was uh, a communist, he had strong communist sympathies uh, and his magnum opus called A, right, his poem, his long um, multifaceted poem called A, um, tends to be seen as both radical in form and radical in politics. Um, this may be overemphasized a little. Um, but he, you know, he did have communist sympathies. Uh, later, he grew disaffected with communism, uh, as did many communists, um, when it was, you know, seen what Stalin uh, was was doing in Russia. Um, so he, he, his later poetry is less political. Um, the other poets weren't as as politically oriented at all. Um, um, so it it tends to be interested in history all the same, right? There is a st relatively strong interest in history, not just the the representation of objects uh, and geography, especially especially Lorene Niedeker. Um, she has a strong interest in nature and geography. Um, so, uh, a lot, uh, some of them uh, did away with mythology as well. Um, uh, they didn't tend to go in for mythological narratives. Uh, in fact, narrative tends to go out the window, um, generally, in their poems. Um, this being said, uh, some of their writings are um, uh, linked to the Bible, um, especially Charles Reznikov. Uh, his his interest in in Hebrew scripture uh, tends to impinge a lot on his interest in objects. Um, now Reznikov is uh, known for his um, sequence uh, on Hebrew literature. Um, he t was in inter interested in the Bible uh, and the whole magic of Hebrew. Right, so he had a kind of slightly double consciousness in that his, uh, his devotion to objectivism is, um, is allied with his interest in, uh, in the Hebrew Bible um, and this Jewish diaspora uh, that he was a part of. Um, so he was also interested in um, Jewish testimonies uh, and the testimonies given at Nuremberg during the Nuremberg trials. Uh, now this is his most controversial work um, because uh, he tended to use the testimonies that were given in Nuremberg uh, and decontextualize them and uh, change the narrative form uh, from the eye uh, of the testimonies that were given uh, to a uh, a more authorial uh, he or she. Um, so there is a slight transforming of these of this uh, this text right, that he he uh, came across. Um, but it's still what's called a found poem, right? Found poetry is poetry that you might take from a, a newspaper. Or, or a book or any text and you, you, you take the exact text often without changing anything uh, and you just lineate it. Right? You just change the, the line structure and that's called a found poem. So he, he, that's what he did um, 
with these testimonies. So it's it's both profoundly stirring and slightly disturbing um, in that he decontextualizes them and, and therefore partly takes away from their authenticity. Not in a radical way though. Um, so you could call this kind of a kind of documentary poetry um, where he's taken an object, right? these, these testimonies um, of the 1940s and he's made it into another object, a slightly transformed object. Um, now his prosaic language uh, is sometimes heightened by more biblical language, as I said, but generally the, the objectivists tended to favor a rather prosaic language with the occasional rare word. Right? So there, were, there was a bit of mixed register uh, effects. Um, so now these collagist found poems uh, weren't used by the, the, the others um, as much. Louis Zukofsky does have um, snippets of, uh, you know, philosophers like Spinoza or Aristotle mixed in with the descriptions of his family life at home. Um, so there is a certain amount of collagist um, poetry mixed in with more spontaneous um, poetry. Um, now a lot of them were interested uh, in experience as a kind of never-ending flux, uh, particularly Charles Rakosi. Carl Rakosi, sorry. Um, now he has a, a good quote here uh, which is a kind of, um, you could say a kind of uh, motto um, or a credo for the movement and that is, um, he said, not to aggrandize perception, not to inflate the lyric impulse, that seems to go counter to one's whole romantic thrust, the thrust of poetry itself, and yet that is integrity. Right, so you have this desire to move away from subjectivity, and the impingement of the ego, uh, the poet's self. Uh, so a withdrawal from that, that to a, to a certain extent, was what the objectivists uh, were attempting to do. Um, but not, you know, wholeheartedly, I would argue. Not a, by any means all the time. Um, but there's a, a good in, uh, example from a poem um, by Carl Rakosi called The Vow, uh, which you could also see as another um, Ars Poetica um, that defines uh, the movement uh, and its objectives. So uh, just one line, uh, he says, Matter, with this look I wed thee, and become thy very attribute. So you see a kind of melding of the poet with matter itself, with other objects. Uh, so it's not quite like uh, Andy Warhol who said he wanted to be like a machine, um, but there is some attempt to depersonalize the self, to treat the self as, as a kind of object, but also to emphasize the, the, the look, right? the gaze of the author and, and what you know, that brings to the poem. So a kind of slightly contradictory approach to, to perception, where perception is foregrounded and yet denied at the same time. Uh, and this self-canceling uh, tendency is present uh, especially in Carl Rakosi and Lorreen Niedeker. Um, a tendency to undo uh, the poem as it unfolds. Right? So uh, Rakosi's frequently dyadic structures uh, 
are these two lines that kind of echo each other, sometimes cancel each other out. Right? So one, one uh, statement is then, or one snippet of, of poem uh, is then cancelled uh, or denied by the, the, the snippet that follows. Um, now, I'll just give you a little quote uh, f by Lorene Niedeker, uh, who's kind of considered uh, a sort of anonymous Emily Dickinson. Right? Dickinson was anonymous in her time, um, but she's now extremely famous, whereas Lorene Niedeker has stayed in the shadows. Uh, and so she is, was a bit of a nature poet, and this comes across very beautifully, I think, in her poem, The Rock. Um, also a kind of definitional uh, poem for objectivism. In every part of every living thing is stuff that once was rock. In blood the minerals of rock. Thank you.